Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the third episode of Life, Love, and Lipidemia. So, uh, this is the Sunday afternoon chat where we talk about all things non pharmacotherapy, stuff about life, stuff about career, stuff about thoughts. And this is where I invite uh, people whom I know, people whom I trust, and people whom I respect uh, to come in and have a chat with me. So whether you're watching this live or you're watching this on the replay, I hope it entertains you, uh, at least if you're studying hard on a Sunday afternoon, or uh, whether you're bored on a Monday night and you want to have some entertainment. So we're just going to talk. Uh, and today, um, my special guest is my dear friend, Mr. Raymond Liu. Hi, Raymond. nice to meet you. Hey. Raymond, okay, so, <laughs> well, I, I, I've known Raymond for, well, we, it was 10 years since we graduated. 14 years? No, 14 years since we knew each other, but 10 years since we graduated. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. because, because this year, um, 2020, we were supposed to organize the 10th anniversary of our class graduation, and we worked so hard. And thank goodness, and uh, thank goodness. Uh, and unfortunately, actually, uh, COVID happened. So obviously, uh, there's going to be no lunch in August. Hey, but who's to say we might be able to organize it in November or December? Yeah. Or maybe have you online? Or maybe have you online? No one. <laughs> Customized menu. <laughs> Everybody brings their own drink, uh, and uh, join oh, us man. for life, love, yeah. and epidemia. Uh, budget, 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 budget dinner. Easier to organize. Just send a link to everyone. Eh? <laughs> yeah, okay. good, uh, pass the cup. Uh, pass the cup. Well, um, for everyone who doesn't know Raymond, if you if you work in Tan Tok Seng, you might have seen him before. Uh, but of course, Raymond is here to chat with us today, um, on a personal basis as my friend, and coming in to share his thoughts about uh how to find your niche in pharmacy. So um, Raymond's a pretty good friend of mine, you know, and it, I'm, of course, very, very thankful for him to be here because as, as most of you know, it's not easy to find people to come onto the show. And every time I get somebody and somebody agrees, two to three people reject me. So I'm just really happy that Raymond said, okay. And, and, we, and we got it organized pretty fast. Uh, so, so thank you for coming, Raymond. And um, for those of you who who want to know a little bit, right? Raymond and I go back quite a while, and and actually, if you see, wait, let me. How do I do this? Ah, okay. This this was actually our class photo when we were in year one. Uh, year one was which year? Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yes. 2006. Yeah, and I'm right in front, and that gangster beside me is actually Raymond. <laughs> and uh, we work on a number of projects together. I don't even know where we took this. Um, I, obviously, I was very young. I was very innocent. Uh, and look at him. He's obviously the the clubber and the naughty guy, right? <laughs> and uh, we work on even more projects. And this is one of our biggest projects that we work on together. Uh, it's actually called Pharmacy Rex. So we we're actually building a float for pharmacy. You know those floats where, where people drive along Orchard Road or somewhere for Chingay? Chingay. Uh, Chingay, right? Yeah. So, so we actually had to build something like that, but out of recycled material. And uh, that was the year that I took over as rec director. And uh, Raymond was my chief carpenter. <laughs> Very efficient and one of those guys who always got things done. And, it, and it's pretty much testament to how he has lived his life, right? Because it, while everybody just says that, oh, I'm in the float committee, I'm in the executive committee, I'm in the dance committee. Uh, Raymond just said that he was in the float committee, but he specialized in cutting wood and cutting metal. Right? So I suspect this niche thing started from a very, very young age. Uh, back when we, we didn't really know what we were going to do. Uh, well, we actually did. Do you remember there was one day in the uh, society room where myself, Raymond, and two other friends, because our grades were so horrible, so <laughs> we were thinking about, oh, next time, what should we do? Uh, if we cannot practice, maybe we, should, maybe we should do a job 
that puts pharmacies out of job. Yeah. If not, we, we can't find job. Right? <laughs> and, and look at what Raymond is doing now, informatics, automation. So he really he was really true to his word. Huh? <laughs> so, I'm still it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we actually did very, very well. And one of the reasons why we did so well for this huge project, well, not just for us, you know, is if you ask Raymond, if you ask any of our friends, it was really more for pharmacy because we were very proud to have pharmacy uh, as a department to be able to stand up to all the big faculties and to be able to perform well. Uh, such that we, I think we won two of the biggest prizes. Yes, we won two. We won two, yeah. And, and we're very happy because we really wanted to give pharmacy students a sense of pride uh, in being a part of um, this, this, this legacy, really. Yeah, so hi, for those of you who are watching live, uh you will need to authorize our, our app i'm using a new app today because you know last week we, we disconnected like seven times so uh, i i for me to be able to see your name uh you have to give uh the app access all right so just take a look at the chat and you should be able to see the information there but hello hello welcome and uh this was a picture where we won the award you can see my face is blue <laughs> because i was dancing as a alien yeah can't believe it right how can sean ang dance <laughs> practice. No, practice. Yeah. And, and this is this is the gorgeous piece of work that we did and uh raymond was a very very big part of it so, so we spent quite a fair bit of time in school together um and this was year four before we graduated and decided that we would come into the profession and to practice and uh god knows how many patients we've we've harmed already <laughs> Yeah, so 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 that is that is a short history of um myself and Raymond. Uh, so Raymond, welcome. So, how's COVID been for you? Uh, not too bad. Um, majority of days I'm like working from home, but there are days that I still need to be back in the hospital because of uh, meetings, projects, uh, solving things on the front line because of the home delivery load as it is with me. So we have gone from 20, pay, 20 deliveries a day to 600. So a lot of deliveries a day. 600 deliveries a day. Oh, okay. so there's a big overhaul on the workflow required. Oh. Yeah. Wow, OK. So, so we, we read the news last night, and the measures are gradually going to be lifted, starting yes. from the 12th of May, which I think is, is, is great news. And you know whoever is watching this, whenever you are watching this, uh, just know that a lot of people had to stay at home so that we could bring the numbers down. And of course, I'm very, very grateful to all the healthcare professionals, people like Raymond and his colleagues, and a large majority of our friends who are working really, really hard on the front line um, to try to get things done and to take care of our patients as well. Okay. Um, what's one thing you're looking, the, the thing you're looking forward to the most once the measures are lifted? Climbing. <laughs> Sorry? Rock climbing. Back Rock to climbing. the to working out. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so Ray Raymond's passion is actually in rock climbing. So those of you who, who know me, you know that squash is my passion. So rock climbing is to Raymond. It's the same as what squash is to me. Yeah, and I'm it, it's like not everybody will understand how you can pursue a passion for so long. Uh but hey you know a passion is a passion when 10 14 years down the road and you're, you're still doing it even when nobody presses you to do it yeah it's the same thing for work as well uh you need to find your passion at work so mm -hmm. that's you keep yourself moving on ah. well, sp speaking about passion uh, it, it, was pharmacy your first choice because i remember i, I like to ask this question to, to pharmacy people <laughs> it's always the question first question that everyone works uh, asks, yeah, right yeah, yeah. Because pharmacy yeah. was, was my first choice, but I knew that for a number of our classmates, pharmacy was not their first choice. Was it your first choice? On paper, no. But uh, mindset, yes, it was my first choice. But because I was just trying my luck, right? Uh, well, you, you need to aim for the sky and probably hit the ground, the goals, right? So I, as for everyone else, I put medicine, uh, but I wasn't expecting to get in any way. So pharmacy was my second choice on paper. Yeah. Ah. Do you enjoy studying pharmacy? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I I wanted to go into pharmacy because uh, back then when we were in school, right, everyone is like opting for life sciences because it's the in thing at that point of time. But uh, I was thinking that since we, by the time we get our army, we go into university and graduate, the market is going to be saturated. And I thought that maybe life sciences isn't the way to go. That's why I choose pharmacy instead because it gives me a, a professional degree. At the same time, uh, we can practice whatever life science degree can practice as well. So, so I guess it's a it's a uh, killing two birds with one stone, and that's why I choose pharmacy. Ah, yeah, and, and it's one of those things about studying pharmacy because it is it is a professional degree. Yes, it is. Right, and you know, just like how yeah. a number of you will be watching this, and you're wondering, you know, why why am I studying to be a PT? Well, it is a professional skill. Yeah, but you have good, good good results enough to continue your your life in lab and stuff lah, which obviously both of us never. That's why we are doing all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, but in the end of the day, uh, both of us, uh, uh, as in you. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Well, we 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 found we found better uh, options out there, right? From from what we initially intended to do. Uh, I I think at the end of the day is is making the best use of our own skill sets yes, uh, to be yes. able to contribute to community uh, because it's and i think there are a lot of people who who are working right now but they they don't enjoy what they do they do it for the paycheck and i i there was once i was in that position before and i i found that it wasn't easy to actually have to open my eyes and say i want to go to work you know so uh we it found is, our way to contribute it's it's not um it's not um, wrong to be living from um, looking forward to the paycheck, but in the end of the day, um, it's, you have to find your own uh, passion, your own drive in whatever you're doing. Huh. So, so in, in Tan Tok Seng, uh, mm -hmm. and, and at this point, I will stress to everyone again, so Raymond is speaking in his capacity as, as a friend. Yeah, not in his official capacity as a, as a pharmacist at Tan Tok Seng. But in, in your work in Tan Tok Seng, you are dealing with informatics yes. is that right yes. so what exactly do you do in informatics because it, do you do you see patients at all do you dispense uh i do dispense but it's not my primary job scope so over the because uh for weekends discharges right we we are rotated uh in shifts to do um weekend discharge review so i i do i i do do review every like a few months once but my primary role day to day is actually uh, I would if you are, if I were to sum it up, it's usually like three areas. So one of it is um, clinical systems uh, design, right? Um, second one is uh, data analytics, and then the third one is uh, operational redesign. So these are the three main areas that I work. Okay, hey, those are huge things that I I'm not sure even I understand. Sure. So, okay, so so I mean to make it simple for yeah. everyone else who doesn't deal in informatics. Uh, what, what, can you, could you tell us a bit about each of those roles? So like first one is uh, where I mentioned is about clinical system design, right? Um, because uh, the systems that we use in the hospital, it's main prime, part of it is uh, for clinical use, part of it is for workflow uh, operations. So the clinical part, uh, when you design a clinical system, you need to make sure that it's safe. Uh, it doesn't introduce uh, patient safety issues when you are designing a system. So things like example, if a clinician was to um, prescribe a medication, for example, warfarin 9 milligram, right? The system needs to be able to define like, okay, so the, the dosage regimen is 9 milligram. What do you want to give the patient? Do you give them um, one, one milligram, a three milligram, a five milligram uh, warfarin tablet versus- uh, So we nine use one of each different strength. Yes, one of each different strength. So you have three tablets okay. versus uh, you only have one product, about one milligram, but you give nine tablets. So in the end of the day, you must balance out and determine uh, which is a better approach because uh, on one hand, um, you may reduce the, the if you use a nine of the one milligram, you, you, you reduce confusion to the patient because it's only one product to deal with. But uh, it increases this term, what we call a pill burden, which means the number of pills you take for a particular um, 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 that regime for the day, right? Like maybe in the morning, they have to take like nine tablets plus other medications. So they may easily consume 15 tablets at one go. 
So um, you need to balance out between um, what is a confusion for a patient, what is the cost of the medication versus the, the stress on the patient because it's, a, it's, it's dreadful to take so many, so many pills in one, in one shot. So there's a balance and um, all these things are taken into account during your um, clinical design, your, your data, your item um, um, design when you go through your clinical uh, workflow itself. So, so you collect data and based on that data, you design a system? Uh, yes. So like example for taking this example, right? Uh, we do see consumption pattern of usually what are the medications, uh, what is the regime uh, that is being given to the patient. Then we determine um, what kind of uh, product are bringing in. Because some, some products, like example metformin, you have 250, you have 500, and then you have the 850 as well. So which do you bring in? So uh, based on the consumption pattern that uh, the usual patients uh, at my hospital is taking, then we'll focus on one particular strength to bring in. So that at least it, there's not so much confusion uh, for all the patients. And also, it also makes things easier if they are to uh, titrate their doses as well. They don't need to keep changing product and right, to uh, reduce the, uh, the confusion to them. Yeah. Okay, so, so that is the clinical design part of yes. it. What's yes. the other stuff? That you uh, the other stuff is the, the third one is like operational redesign. So like example, if you are taking this particular scenario, um, having 20 home deliveries a day versus 600 home deliveries a day. Obviously, the workflow for uh, 20 uh, orders work, uh, workload uh, it is very different from a 600 day, uh, per day workload. So in that case, you have to change your design. You have to change your um, uh, your efficiency in your pro uh, in your processes. For example, uh, do you can you streamline your picking process? Can you can you cut off some of the unnecessary steps, like example, uh, printing of uh, bill invoices, those kind of things? So you have to you have to redesign it based on your understanding of the ground operations, and as well as uh, the situation and the workload that you are dealing. With. So, so what you're saying is that it, although your main role is in informatics and designing of systems, the clinical experience that you have still counts for a lot? Definitely. Uh, clinical experience and as well as your understanding of the pharmacy workflow, the doctor's workflow, the doctor's habits. So all these things will, des uh, will impact on how the system is designed. Uh, do you want to allow the doctor to click into multiple screens? Or do you want a screen for them to do everything all in one? Uh, it really depends on the profession that's, uh, that's interacting with this system because different systems, uh, different profession has different kind of habits and it really uh, impact on the outcome of how they use the system as well and impacts on the efficiency of how they turn around between patients as well. So which means you have to understand yes. doctor's prescribing patterns as well. Yes, you need to understand their prescribing patterns, their prescribing habits. Uh, when they see a patient, uh, do they typically just copy the previous order or they cut from scratch? If they copy from a previous order, uh, how do they copy and this kind of thing? So, so you really need to get into the heads of every single profession, including your finance or business office folks, your nursing, your mm -hmm. social worker. So, so it's not really, informatic is not a very, uh, uh, it, it's not really focused only on the pharmacy, but it's focused on the whole patient journey, which means that uh, it's a very interdisciplinary stuff and you interact with different disciplines to design the system as well. Wow, so you actually have to know people from outside of pharmacy. Yes. So yes, we always uh, talk to uh, people who are very introvert, right? Yes. Uh, people like me. Uh. <laughs> you know, we think we just stay in pharmacy and... <laughs> For me, same for me. Yeah. That, that, you're introvert also, right? Of course. <laughs> well, that's why we are in pharmacy, right? <laughs> Hello to all the introverts. <laughs> so um, when you started your career in 2010, right? So we graduated in 2010. Did yep. you go straight into informatics or do, do you do you have to master clinical dispensing first? Um, when I went for interview in uh, in the hospital, right? Uh, I did told my uh, my interviewer, which is now my boss, right, that I do not want clinical. 
I only I uh, I'm looking at the informatics because I know that they have some automation project uh on uh coming up. That's why I told them uh what I want to do. But even so, um after my pre reg uh and during my pre reg, obviously you need to go through the same training that everyone is going through your clinical path. Uh, why so? Uh, although yes, we are weak. Me and Sean are weak in clinical, right? But uh, oh, oh, that's you, not me. Eh? <laughs> what is important is that we need to get our uh, our infrastructure um to a decent level because without all this basic foundation, it's very difficult to practice whatever specialized skill set you need to achieve in, including informatics. Because without clinical understanding, obviously, I will not be able to um address and design clinical systems, uh, how to identify loopholes in clinical system. So all these uh, foundations plays a part in uh, bigger things to come, which is important that you all need to not lose your foundation and grow from your foundation to something that uh, you want to specialize in in future. So, so what you're saying is that the foundation of everyone who is practicing is clinical dispensing, learning how to treat a patient well, to, to serve a patient safely, etc. Mm -hmm. Right? How did you know right at the start, during the interview, that you wanted to do automation or, or you didn't want to do clinicals in that sense? How do you know so early? Mm, because for me, um, I, I would always prefer, as you know, we are all introvert. Lah, so if you ask me if I were to operations, informatics versus handling a patient, clearly you know which one we will pick, right? Uh, that is one. Second one is because um, I've always have a keen interest in informatics, IT, uh, anything IT related. So so I thought that, well, it's like um, doing something that you are, it's like your hobby, but it's also your, um, uh, it's also part of your profession at the same time. So that's how I decided, hey, maybe this is a path that I can take. And because I've I've more uh I'm more passionate with uh, informatics related then uh with passion you will probably you know, be more motivated to go in that area, so that's how I concluded that I want to do informatics. Uh, and and the path is not easy, right? Because even though it, something is your interest, uh, there there must be a pretty steep learning curve because that's not how we were trained in school. Yeah, definitely. Because um, well, have you seen an informatics course in our uh, in our in our core lecture? No, right? You probably you will take like um, um, electives or uh, read up on yourself, right? Um, when I got into the role, uh, actually after pre reg, um, I was supposed to shadow my senior to set up two new pharmacy. So uh, there he he was supposed to clear his leave, so he went on leave for two weeks. But two days later, he came back with a cast on his hand. He Ooh. broke his, he broke his hand. <laughs> so in the end of the day, uh, it was a trial by fire for me. Uh, basically, uh, with zero knowledge, I uh, figured out my way. Uh, I bite the bullet and then I set up two pharmacy from scratch. So uh, you were literally thrown into the deep end. Yeah, literally just thrown into the deep end. But uh, well, that's what makes you stronger after you get out of it. Hey, not so bad after all. <laughs> Well, today our, our main topic is actually about finding your niche, and and you have very clearly found your niche, which is in uh, informatics, and it, you know it's not everybody can find their niche so easily. A lot of people don't even know what their niche is, mm. right? or what what they even want to do. But I mean, first of all, let, let's let's talk about this. Do you think that in the pharmacy profession, the pharmacy profession as we know it, is it important to have a niche? Um, I I guess it's a personal uh, preference, and to be frank, I don't think that specialization it is a must. Why so? Because um, it's in the end of the day your own comfort of what you believe in, what's your passion, right? Um, without a niche rule, without specialization, a generalist, you can still survive in the industry, but it's how you perform uh, your general your generalist role that makes a difference. Uh, a person can um, can be very good in one skill, but if you polish it, that's what we, that's what makes a difference uh, in your contribution to society to the community. Uh, so, so, so yeah. the person who is very let's say his his or her key interest is in 
dispensing, no matter whether your PT or your PA or your your pharmacist, right? So let's say you have a core skill. In this case, let's use the example of a PT, all right? If, if your core skill is dispensing and you are keen to carry on being really good at dispensing, well, do you think that that might eventually end up to be some kind of specialty where you're just really, really good at what you do in dispensing? Uh, my opinion is that a niche or a specialty is something that is uh, not practiced by the majority of the population. But um, being good at something, it may not be a specialized role, it may not be a niche, but um, being good at something, uh, you will in the end be uh, look, uh, look up to in that area of the work. So yes, um, if, you, if you have worked in a pharmacy before, right, um, you have noticed that there's always this particular patient, this particular uh, uh, old uncle that always want to look for someone to dispense. This means that actually that person has um, has made an impact to that pers to person's life. And then that's where it becomes a very personal trust kind of thing between that healthcare professional and the patient. And it's something that uh, you, it's, it doesn't mean that you, by specializing, you can reach that level. But right? a generalist, if you have gained a, uh, a patient's trust and the, pers uh, and the patient un uh, listens to advice, hey, you have won, uh, you have won the battle. And in the end of the day, you perhaps you can contribute more to the success of the therapy than a specialist. Ah, it actually reminds me of what um, Prof. Alex Chan, one of our professors, mm -hmm. for those of you who, who might not know. So I was at a, a pharmacy or faculty of science alumni dinner with him. Uh, and he was we were talking about you know pharmacists being not so forthcoming sometimes. And we were, talk, we were wondering why that is so. Because, you know, there are some people who are technically very strong. And I think Raymond and I would be first to admit that there are a lot of our classmates who are clinically really, really strong. And they are doing a really good job uh, in pharmacy. Uh, but they are not forthcoming. And, you know, it's, he was asking me, he told me, he said, I went to a pharmacy and I saw this particular pharmacist there. And there were three or four people who were queuing, they did not want to speak to anybody else, they only wanted to speak to that pharmacy. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was saying, you know, I, I don't really care how good clinically you are, but if you can communicate with the patient and you can get your message across, then I think you're way more effective. Of course. Uh, and that was something that was, was pretty eye-opening for me, uh, especially considering that, that strong foundation in, in clinical skills when, when we were in school. That's why actually for ministry, uh, what they are also striving is also uh, care in the community. It's due to what you mentioned that they are trying to uh, achieve something like what they have done in China. Right? Uh, the care in the community to have the doctors going to the patient's house and then have those kind of um, very close relationship. And that makes a better success in a therapy than someone that does prescribing uh, without any uh, emotion. Right? Uh, oh, Go to the patient's house, that, that sounds like a niche as well. <laughs> yeah, so, so they are trying to achieve something along that way. It can be just like a pharmacy, like a guardian or a Watson in, in Amokyo, mm -hmm. for example. Right? If the patient is able to trust the person and the person has enough tools to serve this patient, hey, it's better than going to a specialist center at the end of the day. Very interesting. Well, so... Uh, uh, while we look on that topic of you know you being able to find your niche because of your interest, um, a lot of people don't know what they are interested. They don't know what they want to specialize in. They don't know what's their niche. They want to do something different. They want to be really really good at something and to be known for a certain skill. Mm. But they don't know what to do because they say, hey, you know, every day my job, all I do is I sit down there and I just dispense all. They ask me to do what I do, lor. You know, how, I mean, the question is this, you know, in, in this crowded field of pharmacy, how can somebody find their niche, whether they are a PT or a PA or a clinic assistant? Mm, I think one main, um, um, one main attitude that you need to have is uh, not, um, don't, don't stop questioning the norm, right? Um, don't stop thinking whether is there something that you, uh, 
uh, that is currently being uh, worked on, can it be done better? Can it be improved? Even your dispensing, can it be improved? Your, your picking and packing process in the pharmacy, can it be improved? But that's very difficult, right? Because we have a lot of colleagues, you want to change something, then they say, it's, it's, it's always been like that. Well, there's, there will always be a naysayer, but in the end of the day, um, you just have to do it. Whether someone um, is um, going to appreciate it, whether someone is going to give you a green light, just do it. So, uh, for example, I have uh, a few farm techs. They are very passionate in what they are doing, right? Um, and when they see a problem on the ground, for example, um, when uh, because you need to top up your shelf, there's always um, uh, topping up errors, people topping up the wrong bin. So this particular farm tech, they, uh, what she did was she, she made it uh, her own um, project and then she went to design an Excel, like design a, um, a, a, a software of her own to help to, ease, uh, to help to make topping up more safer by scanning a barcode and then they'll point you to a particular bin. And these are actually all done. Initiative to do that. Yeah, it, it's all done by herself. No one asked her to do it. Um, well, she's part of the inventory in uh, inventory team, yes, but uh, she took it upon herself to design this and uh, it became her, her hobby, her project. And then it became something big enough that even the uh, the, the store is using it now from the operation uh, pharmacy. It, it, it expanded to the whole pharmacy being using it. So, so I guess in a day is don't find, um, you don't need to find big problems to solve. If you find that there are small problems within your own area of work, um, no harm trying to solve them by your own uh, capability. If not, you can find someone to help you, throw ideas uh, and with, with your colleagues, and then from there, hey, maybe you can come up with something that is a game changer. And it doesn't need to be something very big, something very bombastic. Just do something in your own capability, and then you go from there. But you need to start by um, not uh not being comfortable not being too comfortable with the with the current right always try to be better that's how you improve and that's how you grow so if somebody decides to do something about an issue right and they take the initiative maybe they don't have coding skills right not everyone has coding skills i don't have mm -hmm. coding skills, you know but if they are able to contribute in a way uh that solves a problem you yeah. think that that's a very important step in someone finding their niche? Oh, it's the initiative because in the end of the day, if you're looking at um, niche rule, looking at, uh, you're trying to figure things out. If you're not going to take the first step to figure things out, no one can help you, right? Even if you are working, people ask you in your appraisal what you want to do in the next three years, next five years. It's always what you want to do. It's not what I want you to do. So you need to steady up. You need to figure out yourself. Do you find that a lot of people don't have an answer to this question? What would you like to do? Uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't have an answer to that question as well. I only know what I can do now. But uh, is any of the um, well, sometimes it's uh, just by, by sheer luck that suddenly you, you come into enlightenment. But before I reach that stage, don't, don't stop asking questions. Don't stop figuring things out. And then from there, maybe one day you'll come up with your own answer even though you might piss people off by asking questions? Uh, well, sometimes, well, you just have to interact with the right people that are uh, patient with you. Well, if you if you find that you someone is pissed off, then, well, okay, fine. Maybe you don't approach this person next time, right? Just find another, person. Find another door, not on the other door. But um, don't leave no doors unopened. Uh, right, does that sound right? So don't leave doors closed, right? Always try to open up uh, and find opportunities. Right. So, uh, well, just have to try out. Uh, not on it's, it's really difficult for a lot of us because mm -hmm. we are not the typical kind of people. I mean, the, the, the typical pharmacy technician, pharmacy mm -hmm. assistant, pharmacy. We are not the kind that will go and knock on people's door and say, I want to, I want to do something. I mean, not everyone has the guts. Um, and it's, it's really uncomfortable to, you know, okay, let's, for those of you who, who might think that you know, you're going to knock on a big person's door, I mean, we sometimes mean going to talk to somebody who is more senior about an issue. I mean, that's a knocking on the door kind of thing, right? But that, that is very difficult for some of us to do. I mean, including me. I think I have to 
muster up some courage before I dare to go and speak to somebody who is more senior than me to try to fix an issue. So I eventually do that. I'm really trembling. You know, so for I, I hear you. So, so, so like that, example, even how, my, my colleague that has been working for five years, they, they also have the same problem as well. But I guess you know they is start small. Don't don't uh just take the first step. You can try to find people that you're close with. It need not be someone senior. It may be just someone your buddy that hey, maybe the person has uh joined the institution at the same time as you. Go out with lunch for the person, right? Then over time, maybe uh, find more people to go out for lunch with. And then it's this small little conversation that builds uh, some kind of trust, some kind of comfort level that uh, it will open up um, um, between the two parties and between a group um, when you can then speak more freely. It's only I when... I think that you should go out with somebody for curry favor? Not really. It's just like, well, it's, you, you don't go... Uh, for me, I, I feel that uh, no matter how busy you are, you still need to go out for lunch, right? And what is better is that you use this lunch interaction to get to know people better at a personal level. Uh, it's when you know people at a personal level and that's when you start opening up to people and people are more receptive to you. And then that's where you can start throwing ideas out, uh, figuring things out for yourself, uh, for the group of you. Then maybe from there, you can find what, you are, what is your calling. And you can also find people that maybe it's like, hey, oh yeah, I found this problem on the ground. What do you think about it? Oh yeah, it's something that I've been living for three years, but I just, I'm very uncomfortable with it, but no one is able to um, um, resolve the issue. So maybe the two of us can do something else. Is this kind of small conversation, random conversation, that perhaps uh, it brings you somewhere. And the only way is that you need to start it, no matter how small it is. Mm. So, uh, so you're saying that a big part of the relationships are actually built when you talk about non work No, definitely. You don't have to, because in the end of the day, you don't want to be very transactional in your interaction with people, right? Like uh, me and Sean, right? We have known each other for such a long time. If we are very transactional, right? Uh, he will ask me, hey, do you want to do, I have this particular live session that's going on. I want to talk about your work, right? Um, if it's very transactional, maybe I will not agree to him. But because it's asked me, it's like, okay, what the heck, let's just try it out. Uh, then it's like, that back in my head, I don't know what I'm getting myself into, but okay, I'll find out. I see the Sean they're asking. So it's this kind of thing. Most of them don't know what they're getting themselves into when they say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's all this um, uh, relationship that you build up with people that in the end of the day, uh, hey, um, you trust the person. Uh, I don't think that he's there to harm me, right? And then that's where you open it up to, uh, to him, uh, to the people. And then that's how opportunities and uh, uh, get born out. So in the end of the day, it's um, building a trust in the group of people and uh, not being too transactional in your interaction with people. Be true with uh, the people that interact with you. And that's how you go from there. And in the end of the day, you'll find working with them uh, more joyful. And that's how you get get on uh that's how you survive in the workplace as well uh so so what you're what you're saying is you when you get to know somebody and you get to know them better on a personal level not so much just work stuff right on a personal level and when you develop a relationship like an authentic relationship right it's not just a uh, i carry favor because you're my senior i want something from you you know but genuinely getting to know somebody and when you know somebody and they open up to you, you realize that there are a lot of things that you can do together. Uh, you might even get opportunities, especially if that person is in the position maybe to offer you a chance to do something. Huh. Well, if it is not in a position to offer you to do something, right? There's always a uh, peer appraisal. There's always word of mouth, right? So all these things uh, indirectly may contribute to uh, you being in some area, but again, uh, not forgetting that be truthful and uh, in your interaction with the person and not curry with the person and uh, not expecting all this in, uh, in return. And that's how you, uh, you, you grow and you go to places. Because uh, if, you, if you have high expectation, obviously you're going to be disappointed. But if you have low expectation and you are truthful in our uh, interaction, that's where you gain the most of. 
high enough to be ambitious and, and to have something to work towards. Yes. Hey, Raymond, the last time we spoke, you mentioned to me that you have some pharmacy technicians who are actually in your department. Yes. So uh, do it because I know that most pharmacy technicians, like you know, most of the people who are listening right now, they mm -hmm. go from clinic assistant to pharmacy technician or some from pharmacy assistant to pharmacy technician. And there is such a huge focus on clinical dispensing. How did those is it two PTs? Yeah, so like the example I gave you for the for the shelving, right? Yeah. Uh, you see, it's like because she has a passion for uh, IT programming, she just make it her own point to solve the problem. And then that's how she got identified, how she got recognized. And today, she's actually the lead for the repackaging team that is doing all, all our repackage uh, uh, pack sizes for our automation machine. Mm -hmm. And another one of my uh, pharmacist technician, she, he's actually in my team as well. Um, he's also very into IT. He just um, identified, like, uh, example, the rostering um, team. He has so much difficulty trying to manage uh, the, the rostering, the leaf projection, and the balloting of leaf. He just said, hey, let me help you. Then he just create uh, some system and then said, uh, do you maybe you will find this um, uh, useful for you? And in the end of the day, they adopted it. And it has, it has been used for over the past three years. And it did really help in the team's um, um, uh, um, efficiency in terms of handling leaf projection and rostering. So that's why so I'm that, that There is a chance for a pharmacy technician to Definitely. find informatics. But it seems that the core part of it is either, number one, sounding out your interest, uh, and number two, being able to contribute by fixing a problem. Yes. So that's fixing a problem seems to be something that is seen very kindly in the workplace. You know, it, it seems like a very desirable skill. Is that is that your experience for PTs? Um, definitely, it's, it's, it won't be restricted to PT as well. Is uh, it applies to everyone? If you see an uh, issue on the ground. Um, and it really uh, irks you a lot, right? Uh, don't be afraid to say that, okay, this is something that probably we need to address. Um, speak to people if you have, uh, if you feel that uh, you have limitation in what you can do. But uh, by acknowledging the problem, that is the first step to problem solving. Mm. Right, so uh, taking the example of this home delivery issue now due to the COVID-19, um, our home delivery has spiked and we are encouraging patients to not come back to the hospital. But um, the delivery uh, website has limited um, um, fields to handle uh, information that we need to fulfill a delivery. So in the end, you have to call the patient up almost for every case and that reduces the efficiency of the whole process. Um, Health Hub, they do have options for you to uh, order your medication for different hospital, but um, there is a limitation of how fast it can turn around for some customization. Like example, the number of days you open up for a delivery, the collection point. So all these become limitation. So what one of the pharmacy technician did was he created a form using form SG to allow patient to submit their order with as much information as possible. And in the end of the day, majority of the patients that submit the orders through this particular platform, we do not need to call them up. We can fulfill the order by the amount, by just by the information that um, they have given us. And this helps us in terms of, uh, it, it improves our turnaround time uh, because there's lesser calls, there's lesser uh, confusion, there's lesser um, misunderstanding in the order that's in place. And what, is ha what happened after this was instead of just benefiting us, our head of department actually shared at the um, chief pharmacy, pharmacy manager meeting. And lo and behold, INH and Ting Pong took up his template and redesigned it and they are using it now. So um, a problem can be small, but if you resolve it in the end of the day, it may benefit beyond uh, 
uh, beyond the institution. Uh, and anything that, because pharmacy is actually a very close community, whatever good they are done, uh, we always want to share and help each other. And that's how um, the, the, the good that we are doing has been uh, shared with other people. Uh. So in this case, although it's just a pharmacy technician doing a, a form, maybe simple, maybe complex, but it benefits beyond the institution. So every small little part that you pay, it can have a big benefit. And I think well, yeah. that there, is, there is another part of it uh, where it seems that well, fixing a problem is never easy. Right? If it was easy, it would have been fixed a long time ago. You yes. know, it, there must be some characteristics or some attitudes that are very important for you know, a pharmacy technician who wants to find his niche or her niche. Because it, it's really tough. It's tough in a place where you know, you're like in the middle. You have people whom you report to, you have you know, people who, who report to you sometimes. You know, it's what do you think are some of these characters or some of these attitudes that are important for a pharmacy technician uh, to succeed and to you know, be good at something and maybe find their niche? So, like just now, what we have been spoke, uh, talking about is like uh, never stop questioning. It may be something that's done 10, 20 years, but uh, Doing something that is for one to two decades doesn't mean that is the right way to do it, right? Our technology, our processor has improved. And if the workflow was 10 or 20 years ago, likelihood is wrong already. You need to improve it. So always um, be in a state, uh, always um, identify uh, issues. Do not, uh, do not stop questioning the norm, right? That's one. Um, always take initiative. If you find an issue, verbalize it. If even better, get a hands-on, try to solve it. If you cannot solve it, bring it up to someone. It may not be higher level. It may be some, it may be a peer, right? Then be good in something. You can solve it together. And that's how you, over time, you, you, you develop a, a, a skill set to uh, want to improve. And in, over time, uh, other than just improving the processes, you also indirectly improve yourself. And perhaps from there, that's when you get to know your niche. And, and I think there's something that you mentioned that I find was very interesting. You don't have to do this alone. You know, sometimes you, you find your niche by working with somebody else. And you know, when we always say you want, you have to be really good at what you do, it, it doesn't mean that you always have to do it on your own study, on your own, learn coding in the night time. If you don't have to do that. But everybody has different skill sets. And sometimes it's through those meaningful conversations, authentic conversations, that you start to understand what someone else's skill set is. And, and you can work together. I mean, you have to believe that you are unique as well. And you definitely have something to contribute to the system. Because, I mean, it, I, I see so many PTs uh, who always have this mindset that it, I, I am just a PT. I'm same as everyone. But I think it starts with believing that you can actually make a difference. Okay, uh, Raymond, so a uh, few more questions before we let you go. Uh, you're dealing in the future. You're dealing in informatics. You're dealing in part automation. With all this IT, informatics, systems, database stuff, huge words. But if this is the future, how do you think what skill sets do you think are important for a PT to have to survive in the future? I mean, we're not talking about just finding your niche now, but in the next three years, five years, what should a PT, what does a PT have to do to stay relevant? Okay, so um, I think um, what we need to know is uh, what is the change that's coming up before we need to know what to do to stay relevant, right? Uh, as you know, there's a lot of automation going on in terms of like in the hospital, every hospital has this thing called OPAS, Operational Automation System, right? That fix and packs medication, some can even label. Um, and also um, like there are some particular application that's been developed, like example, Doctor Anywhere, right? That you can just key in um, your your symptoms and then they'll figure out for you as a triage to, to determine, hey, maybe you have a common cold, right? Hey, maybe you have a, a sore throat. 
So, so all these things become, if you notice uh, what is common across all these things are actually uh, reproducible knowledge. Reproducible means that um, for every situation, if you go through step one to step 10, right, you will come with the outcome. Like example, you're picking a packing process, you need a label, uh, you need to print a label, you need to stick on the box, you need to check. If things that are reproducible, if repetitive work, then those are the things that can be automated. So, so if the thing is that in, in automation, what they tend to do is to try to find patterns. Yes. Sequences of things where all you need to do is step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and you reach an outcome. And the aim of the system is to reproduce that whole system automatically. Correct. So things, all these things, if you are working in, um, if you realize that the job that you are performing uh, is as per such that it can be after one to 10, you'll definitely come with the same outcome. Then I must say that you are at risk because a machine can uh, replace you. So that's when you need to know that, hey, I need to go beyond this work, right? Um, things that it's probably not, not um, replaceable by uh, machines is of course the human point of things. Uh, look at an example for uh, banks, right? We, we call a bank because now COVID-19, right? Everyone start at home, cannot go bank, right? So got issue, what you do? You call the bank, right? They call you press one for credit card waiver, press two for internet banking services, press three for your bank account stuff. But you notice that at the end of it, there's always a press you to speak to the operator, right? You need to find out of this future automation, right? Identify which is your one option one, two, and three, and how can you be that press zero to be the operator? And in order to do that, uh, the only way to do that is to remain human, to always um, value your interaction with uh, your peers, your patient, and be that person that the patient will always approach you if there's any big or small issue that, or any question they have uh, for their review. And then so, that's. That uh, a human can do, but a robot cannot do. I mean, how how as a person do the future? What do you think is the difference between a robot dispensing and a pharmacy technician dispensing? Because you know, the, um, body language is a very human thing, right? Uh, emotions and body language is something that's very difficult to pick up by a system, right? So it's when you interact with this patient, you you sense that there's something different about the body language of a person and that's how you improve and that's how you vary your counseling and help to achieve a better outcome for the patient because in the end of the day uh, they may be not uh, they may have a lot of um, fear in the treatment and it's from all this body language or interaction with the patient that you pick it up and then you help to alleviate their concerns and in the end of the day they benefit from the therapy that they're getting so all these kind of things uh, perhaps it's not so apparent to automation. You can have a machine that say picks up something in the secure locker and then, hey, uh, please pick up your medication from box number two. But that's all you can do. But you will not know, the machine will not be able to improve on the outcome. They can just tell the patient, please eat two tablets a day, for example. Right? But uh, in the end of the day, it's like your interaction with patient that you find out whether uh, is taking nine tablets of one milligram warfarin, is it a chore? Or because you are doing that because the therapy is too confusing if you have too much product. And all these things are actually how you value at a uh, clinical practice that a machine cannot do. So, so what in this case, the point is to stay here. Action and human emotion that will be very hard to be replaced by robots. Yes, yes. So, so it means, it seems that Systems and processes are so much easier to be automated as compared to person-to-person -person relationships. Mm. And you think that that's very important for a PT to be able to master the skill of yes. being able to, to form a relationship with, with a patient rather than see the patient as a transaction. Yes, Would that yes, right. So, so, um, Oh, well, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, can you repeat yourself again? The the last statement you are talking about. So, so I was saying that um, 
humans bring more emotion and they build a relationship with the patient. Uh, but robots can't do that and will find it very hard to do that in the future. Would you agree? Um, yes, I agree. So um, there was always a saying uh, in terms of IT, in terms of automation, right? Uh, you notice they always use the term enabler. So automation is an enabler, right? Uh, informatic system is an enabler. But you notice that uh, they are not uh, marketed as a replacement. Right, and it's definitely not a disabler of processes. So being an enabler, what does that mean? It helps to improve the process. It do not take over. So while it can help to fine tune your picking process, but in the end of the day, it's how it enables the pharmacy profession is that it removes the need for human to do the picking and packing process so that you can do more value at the staff, which is the interaction with the patient. So what we did that, you are not trying to do better than what the machine can do. You're trying to do better at what the machine cannot do with your interaction and the counseling. Well, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Mm. So, so that's how you find all these areas that the machine cannot help in the process. And that's where you improve on those areas. Yeah. So, so for everyone else here who's listening, this is the reason why you're still learning how to write medication labels. This is the reason why uh, pharmacy students we still learn to use Pestle and Mota. Because when the systems fail, systems help us. Uh, but when they fail, right now, how many of us in real practice can remember the full requirements? You're so used to a computer system doing it for you. And uh, sometimes you call people like Raymond, even though it's not his job. <laughs> that's, that's what happened for the clinicians, you know. Like, they'll call the pharmacy and, uh, how do you write a control drug prescription? Because everyone has been using a system, they don't know how to do pen and paper anymore. And everyone who is in the farm tech course, after hearing what Raymond said in your mind, you probably, you not probably, you better know what are the requirements of a conjugal drug prescription. Okay. Um, so uh, we've spent almost an hour with uh, Raymond. And I, I suppose some of the key things that I, I took away from, you know, this very insightful conversation, uh, well, what first thing is robots are here to stay, but humans should focus on the emotional connection that we build uh, together, I mean, with our patients, because if the robots are there to do things that are repetitive. So it, basically, if you work like a robot, you'll be taken over by a robot, right? And when, when we spoke about the uh, how to find your niche, in pharmacy, well, not everybody gets to find their niche, at least not easily. Sometimes it takes a longer period of time. Sometimes you find it by accident. But the, the three things that you know, I, I hear from you are, number one, um, it's important to build meaningful relationships. You know, and the strongest relationships are when you talk about things that are not work-related, things that are outside work. You know? So number one tip for all of you, don't go to lunch alone. Find somebody to go and, and speak to and get to know that person as a person, not because you want to carry favor, right? Number two, one of the very important things is if you have an interest, sound it out. Let people know that you're keen so that they can give you opportunities. And I mean, if it's if it's in your performance appraisal, just say, I'm interested in this. I'd like to offer some opportunities in this. And, you know, to take the initiative to, to sound it out because if you keep quiet, nobody will ever know, and you will never have the opportunity to stumble upon something that could be your niche. And and finally, one of the important skill sets that Raymond spoke about is really to never stop questioning and always fix a problem. No matter how small the problem is, you have to get into the mindset of if this can this thing be better, if it can be better then we should do something about it. Maybe not alone, but you know, with someone else who has the expertise, we work together and, and you get it done. Would that be pretty much a good sum up of, of what you have shared? Uh, yes. So another point that I want to add is that um, always remember that your, your foundations is important because it's only when you have your foundation up to date, that's when you 
um, provide meaningful solutions to the problem. So I always have this story that I want to share with uh, uh, with people that is doing projects. Is that um, there is this particular um, factory right that does packing of box, uh, items in a box, but the fail the failure rate is so high. There's always like twenty percent of the boxes are empty, and then they had a very high complaint uh, for their uh, processors. So what they did was they hired a consultant. Right, uh, the consultant designed a million dollar product to have weight sensing on the conveyor so that if the box uh, is doesn't have the weight, it will stop the conveyor sound alarm so that a staff can go and rectify the problem. Right. But uh, when the management went back to uh, to check the statistics, after one week, hey, the error dropped down to zero. So they were very curious, they went to walk the ground and they started to ask. The people on the ground. How did it happen? You know what the, the floor manager said? Oh, the alarm was so irritating. So I put a huge fan. If the box is empty, you'll blow off the conveyor. Right? So in the end of the day, your problem, uh, the problem statement is there. But with your ground knowledge, your ground expertise, a simple fix may solve a huge problem. And you may it may cost ten dollars rather than a few million dollars. So don't try, don't stop trying. No uh, solution is too small. It just has to be the right solution. And you never know if it's right sometimes unless you try. Yes, correct. And okay. your ground foundations help, your interaction, your experience help. So nice. Okay, I think we will leave uh, one minute or two minutes. Uh, let's have two minutes in case anybody would like to ask Raymond a question. So we will be looking at the chat. Uh, if there are any questions you want to ask. And in the meantime, while you're thinking of a question, I'm going to ask Raymond something. You work crazy hours. <laughs> yes. Sometimes no day, no night. When, when I think of like me running a business, I, we work so long hours. But you, it's, it's incredible the number of hours you work. You have don't know how many phones, how many computers at home. Uh, especially now when it is COVID period, you are working even harder. You know, it's, isn't it difficult? You know, because I mean, there are a lot of people who are saying whether I work 42 hours a week or whether I work 60 hours a week, the company still pays me the same amount of money. Why, why should I work 60 hours a week? Why, why are you working 60 hours a week? Aren't you tired? Mm, definitely, it will be mentally and physically drained. But at the end of the day, um, in my own opinion, is that you need to have a, a guiding post. Right, uh, you need to have a, your own mission, your own vision to push you along. So if you are true to yourself, uh, then that's how you uh, unknowingly work the extra hours. Right? So for me, I always find that um, um, the few, there, there is a lot um, that can be done for the future of healthcare. And by doing those, um, eventually you and I will be the, com the consumer of that healthcare. So what I'm doing now, uh, it is like an investment to the future of our retirement. And well, by when you retire, that's when you rest, right? So um, that's how you find um, uh, your, um, that's how I find passion in what you're doing. And by having passion, that's when the hours becomes a blur and you are not so affected by it. But that being said, um, it's, it doesn't mean that I do not have rest. I do not have time for my own activities. I still do climb at least once to three, one to three times a week, I still have a rest, right? Um, so in the end of the day, you have to find a balance in your work life, but uh, that doesn't stop you from uh, pushing the number of hours you work, right? Uh, because um, all these things are investment, but in order to invest, you need to believe in what you're doing. And that's the only way that um, you can, in the end, you can just um, unknowingly work going above and beyond. Uh. Mm -hmm. that so, so it's something that that is oh two ways I suppose. It could be a personal goal, a personal aim. Mm -hmm. Uh and it also could be something that's bigger than yourself. Yes. Mm. All right. So let's take a look at the chat. Okay. Um if there are no questions, uh please join me in, in thanking Raymond for taking his 
Sunday afternoon to come and chat with me. <laughs> All right. Uh, spent 10 years doing amazing work and contributing a lot to the informatics side of so us. I, I guess you and I contribute in our own ways. So uh, the rest who is listening in, you try to find your own way to contribute to what you believe in as well. Yep. And if you want to find your niche in pharmacy, number one, according to Mr. Raymond, one, build meaningful relationships. Number two, initiative, sound out your interest. Number three, never stop questioning. Always fix up no matter how small it is. Right. Raymond, thank you everyone who's here. Thank you very much for spending time with us on this Sunday afternoon. If you have any other questions in the chat, uh, Raymond will get back to you and he will answer those questions. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. -bye.